Good morning, good afternoon. My name is John Herbst. I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. We have a terrific event for you today on the impact of Russian sanctions. Um, Vlad Milov will be delivering a report, which we will then discuss. Uh, and our speakers are, again, we have Vlad Milov, who is the Vice President for International Advocacy at the Free Russia Foundation. We have Charles Lickfield, who's the Deputy Director and Seaboy and Gray Senior Fellow for the Geoeconomic Center. Uh, we have Alina Rybakova, who's the Deputy Chief Econom Economist of the Institute for International Finance. And joining us in a little bit will be Leonid Volkov, who's the Chief of Staff to Alexander, Alexei Navalny and the Political Director of, his, of Navalny's team. Sadly, we do not have with us today the indomitable Dan Fried, who has a problem, well, he's, he's just out of sorts today. Thank you. So Vlad, over to you to talk about the report and then we'll have our conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. And I think it's a very important and timely discussion. So many thanks for organizing this. Uh, we recently saw a lot of really lightweight analysis uh, of uh, what is the impact of international sanctions that have been introduced against Russia since the beginning of uh, Putin's war and aggression in Ukraine. And uh, uh, I think it's really important that uh, policymakers, commentators, observers are looking into uh, much of the detail of what's going on with the Russian economy, the impact of sanctions on Russian industries, uh, markets, society, and so on, beyond just a handful of macro indicators that are frequently used in the headlines like GDP or a ruble exchange rate or unemployment and, and so on. So what I tried to do, I, I recently extensively published on this matter. This, this is just one of the examples, the report which I did for the Wilfred Martin Center in Brussels. Uh, I try to offer a, a very complex look uh, through many of the indicators, industrial performance, uh, retail trade and transport and uh, other uh, economic indicators which offer a, a much more detailed picture of the impact of uh, sanctions. So what we generally see is that the contraction of economic activity because of sanctions is very significant. It's somewhere in the range of 5 to 10 uh, percentage points year on year. Wherever you look at, is it retail trade or is it cargo transport turnover or is it what I uh, think is the most important indicator is the non-oil and gas tax revenue of the Russian federal budget. That means all the taxes collected um, uh, by the budget beyond the oil and gas revenue. So how the enterprises, how the economy is, is uh, really doing. So the picture is pretty grim for the Russian government. Moreover, there is no improvement. Uh, in uh, late spring, in early summer, we heard a lot of talk about uh, you know, potential recovery by the end of the year, that the worst hit will be in the second or third quarters of last year, but then the economy will start to rebound. We just don't see general signs uh, of anything like that happening. I see there is a lot of optimism by commentators about the prospects for 2023, like IMF recently revised its outlook uh, upwards. But then again, we're really talking about macro indicators which are not really indicative of, of what's going on the, in the economy. I think one of the uh, key indicators that I heard in the past few days was um, a survey of Russian business done uh, with the participation of APORA, a business association, where uh, the, the, the number one problem indicated by the entrepreneurs that is constraining their performance and development was a lack of consumer demand. 50% said that that's the major problem, decline in real incomes, real wages, and plunge in consumer demand that is constraining development. On the background of that, investment is not coming, import substitution is not truly working. We could have just referred to a recent spat on January 11th between Putin and his new vice prime minister on uh, import substitution, Mantorov, where Putin sharply criticized Mantorov, saying, you should sign the contracts with enterprises, but it's not really working. And pivot to Asia is not truly working because uh, uh, Russia is confronting a very serious problem of facing a major discounts on oil and gas and other commodities that are being sold to Asia. So we try to uh, make a complex and offer a complex analysis of the impact of sanctions on the Russian economy. It is big. Uh, it's probably going to be progressing significantly over time. Uh, so the best advice to Western policymakers is to exercise strategic patience and 
not to run to, to look at their watch every five minutes. Like if Putin hasn't stopped the war, that means we're doing something wrong. No, uh, the West is on the right track, but it takes time. There is some resilience with the Russian economy. And I think also colleagues in the Lena may be uh, talking about that in more detail. The biggest problem that is emerging as of today is sanction circumvention and evasion imports of critical sanctioned goods and technologies through third countries, uh, China, Hong Kong, Turkey, and others. So I think uh, in 2023, uh, probably the key focus should be not even on introduction of some new sanctions, but rather on monitoring compliance with the sanctions that have been uh, already introduced, because Putin was relatively successful in finding ways how to evade and circumvent that. And I leave it up to colleagues to to pick up on that point. Vlad, okay. thank you very much for that concise description of the report and congratulations on the report. Okay, Charles, you're an economist and have done much good work on sanctions. What is your assessment of the report and its main conclusions regarding the impact in Russia of sanctions? Oh, I have only good things to say about Vlad's report <laughs> and I'm very, very uh, grateful to the Eurasia Center for inviting me to participate. Uh, I work in a very um, friendly, um, Geoeconomic Center, and we've done some very good work together. Actually, Charles, uh, it was my mistake of not mentioning we are doing this along with the Geo along with the Geoeconomic Center. Geo Center. Okay. We, we, our work in uh, um, combination has been uh, very pleasant, and so thank you for inviting me um, to talk about this particular report. Um, there are a few things that I found particularly interesting that I wanted to pick up on. Again, say that they were that they were very um, insightful. Um, first of all, on the extractive industries, oil and gas. Um, the report correctly uh, says that they've been a lifeline over 2022, but that these industries themselves are starting to be affected by the sanctions. Uh, not only through the price cap, which is working slightly better than some commentators would have suggested, at least for now. Uh, for now, we only have the um, crude oil price cap, uh, but there will soon be a ban also on Russian refined products, and the loophole from that, the, the intentional loophole, will be another price cap on refined products, perhaps a bit more complicated. But for now, the sanctions are affecting the extractive industries, and also how the extractive industries regenerate themselves in Russia. Uh, so the lack of, um, for instance, liquid, uh, um, uh, liquid natural gas terminals in Russia, can they build their own? quite difficult without the access to Western technology. So the report is really good at talking about that. Um, and there are a few other things that I want to pick up on that I found particularly interesting. Um, on inflation, uh, in reports that we've written for the Atlantic Council, we've also picked up on this, that inflation is so high that it will create extra liabilities for the government because salaries, pensions are indexed. But this report is more daring than what I may have written and says that actually the government will have to give up on indexation. It just can't afford that, uh, which I think is one of the signposts that people are looking for in Washington of the beginnings of uh, the Russian population feeling the effects of sanctions, feeling the effect of the economic crisis. If the um, payments to pensioners can't be indexed to inflation, you start to have uh, perhaps a bit more of a blowback, at least more than uh, we've had so far. Um, two other things that I found very, very interesting. Um, it goes into some detail on the misuse of the ruble exchange rate as an indicator for the effectiveness of sanctions. It's very good that it does that. Um, you talk about a political reason why the central bank, excuse me, uh, you talk about a political reason why the central bank cannot, uh, for now, uh, transition to a weaker ruble. Um, I perhaps ask whether there might also be technical constraints. Um, transitioning to a weaker ruble makes sense because their income from oil and gas won't be as good this year and they need um, that income to, tr to um, convert more favorably. Um, but transitioning takes um, some sort of steering and perhaps some of their instruments won't be as effective now. They don't have access to the reserves and the interest rates aren't really an effective tool for smoothing an exchange rate transition. So that would be a question for you. Um, and then one final thing about using alternative indicators. So we shouldn't use GDP, or at least not the, uh, mag the misleading sense that GDP um, is, is the best indicator for the effectiveness of sanctions. We shouldn't use the ruble exchange rate. Um, I'd be interested to hear what you think the sort of softer indicators should be. Um, people suggest perhaps alcohol sales or divorce rates. Uh, I was looking just before this panel chocolate, uh, chocolate purchases <laughs> wow. um, for those who don't drink alcohol uh, or perhaps in combination. Um, so I, I did see that alcohol sales have increased slightly. 
not that much, but against a prediction that they would actually decrease after 2021 when, we, when Russia was in lockdown sometimes. So again, just any suggestions from the panel on alternative soft indicators on how the sanctions are affecting uh, the Russian population, Russian economy, I think are very welcome suddenly to observers in Washington. Charles, thank you. Vlad, do you want to jump in on two points he kind of just addressed to you? Well, first, uh, is there are many factors including influencing the current uh, exchange rate situation. And I, I would dare say that the most important thing is these draconian uh, capital controls that were introduced by a central bank. So if these are lifted, uh, the, the behavior still, you know, Russian enterprises continue to work. They continue to make some profit, and uh, I don't think if you survey most of them, I don't think you will find many people who would bet on the strategic strength in the Russian ruble in the future. So if capital controls are lifted, then we'll see what happens with the exchange rate. I mean, so let's look into that. Now, in terms of indicators, again, I suggest a handful of um, economic indicators which still can be monitored. Some of the industrial under output that is still reported, uh, non-oil and gas tax revenue, cargo turnover, retail trade. Speaking about software indicators, some of them are very interesting. Like there was a reporting of 17% uh, year-on-year growth in shoplifting in Russia, for instance. That's unprecedented for, for uh, past years. Or Russian uh, opinion uh, pollsters have reported that about 30-40% of Russians had started to uh, actually spend less on food and basic products because they have uh, financial constraints and so on. Many indicators, that's an interesting discussion, we could take it on, but I like this approach of using a, some array of softer indicators to actually judge what really happens behind the facade of manipulated GDP and exchange rate and so on. Thank you. Alina, you too are a distinguished economist. Uh, what is your overall view of the impact of sanctions on the Russian economy, as well as on Vlad's analysis? Thank you so much. So first of all, uh, th there was an impact, right? That's, let's remember that. <laughs> and I think we shouldn't be sort of caught up in thinking that we, you know, there's a magic wand, we have the sanctions, and then Russian economy disintegrates. And if it doesn't happen, then we completely failed in our endeavors. No, there was clearly an impact. Most of us expected some growth in Russia, whether you measure GDP or another, uh, any kind of indicator, maybe sort of a couple of digits, three, four percent GDP growth this year. Clearly, there is a contraction. Um, as Vladimir pointed out, GDP has always been a very poor number. And yeah, I worked in finance for many years, and I always try to educate investors. It does not matter. Please do not look at it. Please do not ask me about it. But of course, with sanctions, we all came back to this. Rostat has been severely underfunded. Russia is a huge country, and we had a lot of conversations, Vladimir, about uh, fisc uh, fiscal federalism in Russia. It is too centralized for its own good, including statistics collection. So you have this extraordinary year where you have uh, the sanctions, the war, and then President Putin goes and says, we're doing fine. If you're a regional governor or head of the statistics office, what are you going to report to the center? Are you going to report that I'm collapsing? You know the center is not going to give you financing because they cut your financing starting from 2014. Let us not forget that people are already feeling effect of sanctions since 2014 because the government reprioritized the way from education, away from healthcare, social spending towards military and also towards saving the reserves, which eventually were unfortunately, or fortunately taken away rather. So uh, that's why, for example, during COVID, on paper you have lots of beds, but we didn't have closures of the economy. Why? Because the government knew they couldn't afford it. So therefore, the regional sort of authorities, they know there will be no funding. They are not elected. They are sort of appointed from the center. So I'm going to go and back report to the center that I'm having a horrendous time. You know, how, that, how is that going to go down? So therefore, they go back and report we're having double-digit investment <laughs> growth this year, you know. Fantastic, right? And then even, at the, I think, in the president's administration and in, uh, among the sort of still remaining policymakers in Russia, they said, well, wait a second, wait, so we're not going to publish a GDP breakdown like this. We're going to give the headline number first, and then they gave the breakdown because they themselves thought, okay, we're cooking, but can we just slow down on the cooking a little bit here? So, so sum up, you know, in terms of sanctions, sanctions are working. Uh, they were unprecedented, but what does it mean, unprecedented? It means that the current institutional setup is not there yet to be able to implement them successfully. Neither for the US nor for Europe. And we also have a study that just came out on the effect of sanctions and we're looking at very detailed big data analysis on the export control. So data is there. The question is just going and finding it and, and putting it together. So that this year has to be the year of sanctions implementation. Okay, um, that was excellent. You partly answered the question I'm going to ask you now but I'll be explicit. Um, what is your advice 
for economists and other analysts in using Russian government supply statistics? Okay, so, so I think as, as we already started on the alternative sources, I still look, for example, at some of the central bank statistics. Why? Because they have uh, turnover data. You have, they have the payments turnover data. You have some of the financial sector statistics, which you can try to piece together and, and use. There is also a lot of big data, as you know, Bellingcat and the team here knows extremely well how to use. That data is available, the question of going and finding it and analyzing it. So for example, for the export controls, this is one study we put in. We're gonna do another one on the oil price cap. And then uh, I'm also looking at the data on company engagement in Russia. You know, the data is also there, we can look at that. Um, ironically, Sberbank for now still publishes some of their consumer sentiment, which is, I find it also very useful. So I think these are the indicators in addition to what Vladimir pointed out, going down into the details, not just looking at the headline. Thank you very much. Okay, Leonid, you are a political leader in Russia. Uh, what is the impact of sanctions on the attitude of the Russian people toward Putin and his war on Ukraine? Uh, thank you, first of all, for having me here and sorry for being late. We are delighted to have you. Uh, uh, so it's, um, it's interesting. Uh, like. Before the war, we as a like Russian political organization, we were very many times asked about like what's our approach to sanction policy, and we had to be very careful. We always told we are strong proponents of personal sanctions, yeah, because there is no problem for us. Yeah, Putin's friends, oligarchs, those who are stealing money, uh, have to be punished. But kind of like we were very reserved about sectoral sanctions because. We, we saw how propaganda makes use of them. Like of every time like sectoral sanctions are being introduced, they probably seem to open champagnes there in Kremlin because uh, they had enormous food for their propaganda machine. Like you, they could blame everything on the evil West. They could actually steal more and explain to, 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 to the population that like some problems, some economic problems are because like the West is uh, fighting against us. After the war has started, after this second phase of the war has started, things have changed dramatically because even those who were really living not in touch with the reality were able to connect the dots. So I am, maybe I'm saying something like very unusual here, but actually despite all propaganda efforts, like Russians in Russia made a surprisingly good job in understanding what's the reason for their current economic problems. They, most of, there are some of them who still think like this war makes sense, Putin is doing the right thing, so we have to be patient. Like, but everyone understands that the current wave of sanctions arrives as a punishment for the war, so they don't mix up between like the cause and consequence. And in this extent, it is working. And it is working, so it doesn't, contribute to this propaganda uh, point that like, well, the West is against us, that, or they started uh, this and they have to be blamed. No, now people in Russia perfectly know who started this. Some of them endorse, but they know who started. So they don't think the West is doing like a wrong thing with the, with the sanctions. Uh, and the impact is dramatic. We follow, a lot, so we do a lot of Poland, we do a lot of opinion research. Like for instance, 80% of them who had plans to buy something significant for their household uh, told us in the recent poll they had, they had to revisit these plans. 80% of that who <coughs> had plans to go on vacation had to revisit these plans. And these were not very many. <laughs> so less, less than half had plans to buy something large uh, to, or, or to go on vacations. The majority didn't have these plans even before uh, uh, 20, 22 sanctions. Uh, people don't have savings and they realize they will not have uh, any. People really feel like the, the, the impact. Uh, the poorest uh, layers of the society are not that much affected so far. Like the government is trying the best to, to control the prices of, of for like the basic alimentation for like, I don't know, bread and eggs and uh, pasta. Uh, so while the iPhone prices or like uh, Western car prices skyrocketed like 
25 or 250 or 300 percent. The we, we are monitoring the prices. Like the, the prices for the basic goods are still pretty much uh, under control. But yeah, I mean the, the impact is really now being like felt. Um, I would say that your description of the understanding of the Russian people about their circumstances is politically very important and worth watching. Okay. Let's see. Again, we're missing the indomitable Dan Freed, so this means double duty for Charles. So, Charles, I'll ask you the question I was going to ask Dan. Uh, how do you evaluate the policy recommendations in Vlad's report? Then there's a follow-up question, which has your name all over it. Okay. Uh, well, I'm glad I didn't uh, go straight to that in my initial answer. <laughs> um, the policy recommendations are very good. Uh, I like the fact that it starts with strategic patience. Uh, because I think that speaks to one of the main mistakes made by Western policymakers in their, at least their communication about the sanctions, and dare I say it, their own hubris about the power of their own sanctions. Um, the sanctions are ver a very important part of the Western response to the war in Ukraine, a very important one. But they should never have been thought of as the main central part of the response to the war in Ukraine. And I think we now have a better understanding in Washington and also in European capitals and other Western capitals that military assistance to Ukraine is, is that bit more important. That's not the topic of this panel. Uh, Indeed it but is. There, is a, there was a sense, perhaps because the sanctions were so unprecedented, Elena used the word, um, oh my God, uh, a central bank has never seen its uh, um, reserves blocked uh, so quickly overnight. Uh, this must mean that the economy will collapse, and this must mean that there will be a palace coup. I'm not accusing anyone of thinking uh, in such um, cliched a way, uh, but we got close, uh, and I am somewhat guilty of that myself. Um, not, again, in such a sil simple way, but I think uh, we did get carried away right at the beginning. Uh, so strategic patience and encouraging us to use strategic patience, I think, is, is a very strong recommendation, although people are going in that direction. Um, there are a few other mistakes that uh, have been made, I think, along the way around um, energy sanctions, um, creating the anticipation that there would be a, a lack of supply, I think, led to uh, speculation trading and, the, and energy prices are rising higher than they, than they might have done otherwise. Uh, we now see some, we've been lucky as well. There's been a warm winter in Europe. Um, but we, we see that um, we're capable of resilience, especially in Europe, of finding other sources of supply. And perhaps had um, this been done in slightly, a slightly smoother way without communicating that, um, for instance, the German government, that it was extremely worried about supply in the winter, um, perhaps prices wouldn't have risen that high. Although maybe communicating about the concern also meant that people changed their behavior. So I don't want to point the finger anywhere, but I think there was a lack of... Um, strategic thinking around uh, weaning ourselves off Russian energy, which was the right uh, policy, but a lack of strategic thinking about how we, how we got there. The result has been quite impressive and quite good so far. Um, so I'll leave it there. Strategic patience, very, very good. Um, and perhaps a slightly better uh, communication and smoothing our transition out of uh, Russian energy uh, would also have been useful. Okay, I'll be back to you with your own question. But first, Vlad, you have a chance to react to the comments of your colleagues on the yeah, panel. I think uh, I'll pick up on what Leonid have said. Uh, it's very important. Uh, and you got to understand that this uh, progress in understanding of this whole com complex picture by the Russians is rather slow. There is a big inertia in the society. But Leonid had indicated the right important direction, that Russians are beginning to understand uh, what is really happening. And uh, uh, also the, the, the important message that many people are promoting, including myself on this, is that uh, sanctions are not the hammer against the Russian people. They are the cure. Because if Putin uh, is not restrained in his aggressive behavior and what he is doing, that this nightmare and all of these negative consequences might last for a long time. Uh, this, the stronger is the impact of sanctions, the more chance that this war will be over and uh, Russia will stop behaving aggressively the way it does at the moment, and things might slowly be coming back to normal for the Russians as well. So they, they need to understand that connection. It is good, I agree with Leonid, that, uh, that uh, it had began. Important, again, on the indicators. Uh, and, and it's good that we're having discussions like this, because what I suggest is that we really move from uh, policymakers picking up headlines in the media about GDP, exchange rate, and whatever, to having many discussions on, uh, like this on dozens of indicators, uh, 
because this will uh, ultimately in the end produce uh, a complex understanding of a very, very, you know, complicated uh, picture of various uh, cross-sectoral impacts. On the statistics, I would advise to use, again, dozens of indicators which come directly from markets or enterprises. In this regard, like tax revenue, uh, industry performance and retail market performance, these are more credible. Uh, and indicators like inflation are less credible because it, uh, inflation or real incomes, this is calculated according to some vague methodology, which I strongly criticize. I believe that Russian inflation is significantly underreported. The one clue on how to judge that is that uh, the past year, real incomes of Russians fell like by 2%, but retail trade fell by 10 so all of a sudden, Russians prefer to keep their money and not spend them somehow. You know how that happens. <laughs> I, I think the, the explanation is that because if, if you really adjust incomes to real inflation and not the artificially uh, lowered uh, Rostat version of inflation, then you see the real the real in, in impact of sanctions on Russians' well-being. So let's have more discussions like that based on a dozen indicators and the complex monitoring of the picture. Do you have a good number? for the drop in the standard of living in Russia as a result of the sanctions introduced with the big invasion? Uh, I would say, uh, we, we need, I agree with Elena, we need to take into account whatever happened past uh, 2014. Uh, so, but there, so there was a big impact on standard of living as a result right. of the 2014 So, so there, was, there was a lot of really credible analysis by different economists uh, uh, about a year ago, before this uh, recent invasion that Russians on average became 10, 15% poorer in real terms compared to 2013 before the annexation of Crimea. So a year yeah. ago, they were 10, 15% yeah. poorer yeah. already. So we can safely speak about Russians are now being over 20% poorer yeah. on average than they were before Putin started his invasion of Ukraine nine years ago, right. not even last year. Okay. Can I just add one, Please, one jump very in. brief point? Um, something that struck me in the report that perhaps I hadn't quite realized before, um, there's a distinction made, uh, perhaps sometimes exaggerated, between Moscow and St. Petersburg and the rest of the country. Um, and it is true that uh, the lifestyle of people in Moscow and St. Petersburg before uh, the, or the annexation of Crimea involved holidays abroad which stopped back then. So you had already a change in lifestyle. Um, but then the rest of the country, which is important, uh, didn't have that before, didn't have that afterwards. And so there's a t it's, it's tempting to think, well, outside those who will be affected can't buy Western goods anymore, can't travel, and that has already been affected since 2014. Outside those elites, there's not much of a difference. Uh, but there's a crucial point in the report which uh, nobody has any savings. Um, which means uh, when you start seeing unemployment rising, and you already have some signs that factories aren't really working at the same um, cadence they were before, and it's all been sort of frozen and maintained for now, but that can't last forever. If people aren't receiving salaries anymore and don't have any savings, that's when it hurts outside um, the um, parts of society which can no longer travel, etc. So the absence of savings, uh, I think, is an important point, which this report makes very well. Thank you. Okay, Charles, I'm coming to you now. Um, you, you touched upon this a little bit in your last answer, but not fully. Where do you think Western sanctions policy is going? Where is it heading? In particular, relating to oil and gas. And actually, I actually have another question, which I'll ask you after this. Okay. Uh, the, I, there's a lot that Alina can say on export controls, and I don't want to preempt that. Okay. But I think that is um, a very important dimension of 2023. Uh, compliance with export controls and ensuring compliance by non-aligned and um, competitor states. Uh, I think that's quite important. Um, perhaps a slight criticism, in fact, of the report is uh, the fact that Western policy should focus on getting Turkey to sanction Russia. Uh, I don't think there's much. You anticipated um, another question. I was going to please. I, I don't. That's my only criticism of the report. I, do, I don't think that's particularly realistic, unfortunately. Um, I'd even dare say that. Um, sometimes the, the finger pointed at Turkey is a bit unfair. The, some of the flows that are going through Turkey now are legal and have to, had to be reoriented because cargo cannot go through routes by train from uh, Western Europe to Turkey. And we do want to maintain, I think it's an important uh, thing that I want to applaud in Western policy, and perhaps it's <laughs> led to um, the um, 
better understanding of the Russian population for Western sanctions policy, that we haven't gone about uh, removing um, the right for pharmaceutical firms to send their um, medication to Western pharmaceutical firm companies to send medication to Russia, for instance. There are things that we won't do, and I think that's good to make that clear as well. So some of the flows going through Turkey are legal, some are not. Uh, and it would be good to get more info on that, but the, I think the idea that Turkey will join the sanctions coalition is, is unlikely. Um, I don't want to preempt what Lena's going to say on export controls because okay. she's really the expert on that. Okay, we'll leave that. I'll give you a chance, though, to talk about the frozen Russian reserves. And there are people who advocate, and I'm one of them, that they should be used for the maintenance of Ukraine's economy and then reconstruction of Ukraine. Any thoughts you may have on that? Well, it's become a hobby horse of mine, uh, partly uh, by um, accident, uh, in that um, conversations, uh, Chatham House rule conversations that the uh, Atlantic Council had been having with the administration and also some other um, Western European governments, um, suggested to us that uh, they weren't quite aware of the location of the whole 300 billion. Right. Uh, and it's important to remind viewers that uh, the 300 billion figure was derived from Russian data sets, right. dating back to February 1st and even late 2021. Right. Um, not all of these data sets are accessible anymore, so you can see some on the Wayback Machine, but basically the 300 billion is derived from, Western, from Russian data sets. Oh. They indicated at that point where some of their reserves were abroad. You cross-reference that with the uh, countries that were participating in the blocking of Russian reserves, and that's where the 300 billion came from. Now when we've gone looking for it, or uh, our um, friends in uh, Western governments have, um, they haven't quite found all of that yet. Um, so there's a question about whether uh, the data was accurate, whether it was moved in time, uh, but this is a very important question for me, something that I'll be working on uh, over the coming weeks. Um, but it does, I think, it is a sort of precondition uh, for the goal that you have, John, uh, and that I think I, I share to an extent um, of using, that, uh, using those reserves for Ukraine's reconstruction. Uh, I would say, however, that the reserves also do serve as a sort of incentive uh, for Russia to pull out. Um, so there's, there's that, the, the, other flip, the other side of the coin is after all that, um, we haven't talked about lifting of sanctions yet, and it's completely premature given that still Russia is still wearing, waging its senseless war in Ukraine. Um, but hopefully at some point we will reach uh, that uh, chapter. Um, and at that point there is a sort of incentive about the lifting of sanctions and how you incentivize Russian behavior around that. So that's how I'd end that answer. Charles, thank you. I'm gonna jump in with one comment. I apologize for going out of my role as moderator. Uh, I am not an expert on this subject, but I can tell you that I know that in regards to military supply of Ukraine, where I am very much involved, the administration will come up with technical excuses for things it does not want to do for policy reasons. And I would be look very carefully at the arguments that we cannot find the money. We have a very strong intelligence service. Okay, putting that to the side. But, but does it, is, uh, is it, it does, do the 300 billion even exist? No, no, right, but it may be that it does and we're being fed, anyway, we'll just leave it at that. Okay. I, I will actually also jump in on this. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Having worked on, on Russian economy since the early 2000s, actually, I think, um, and closely with a lot of people involved in this issue, Russian uh, central bank had an extraordinary conservative reserve management and uh, extraordinary. And we know there is Norwegian fund, there are a few other funds. And as a sovereign wealth fund and also as a reserve manager, ex just I cannot stress enough, extraordinary conservative. Okay. So they were dragged by the ears into the investment into China, which is less liquid, it's less open. Um, it's unlikely that everybody was fully informed about the war before the war actually ha had started. So if on this side we cannot find the data, that has something to do about our quality of the statistics or potentially reserves being allowed to be moved in time rather than Russian side. So in this state, as much as I disagree with a lot of Russian statistics, uh, the reserve management and sort of the, the how conservative that was happening before the war should have allowed us to have full accounting of where that money is, or at least were at the beginning of the well, war. Well, you just offered a, a tantalizing possibility about the money being allowed to be moved beforehand. Anyway, just, okay. Let's see, who's next? Oh, it's your, your next in any case. All right, uh, where do you see the Russian economy in five or even 10 years if this problem continues and sanctions remain in place? 
Well, I think it is entirely up to us, and it sort of fits well from this previous okay. conversation we just had a second ago. It's a question how we're going to implement sanctions. Right. Because early on, you know, we had, um, and I, I, I ate a lot of criticism about coining Fortress Russia, especially in the beginning of the war. And they, you know, they are not going to do the self-harm in a way that Iran or Venezuela did with macroeconomic policies, at least not immediately. So we need then to sort of realize that it's a long-term issue and we're going to be engaged in this sort of hand-to-hand combat with sanctions uh, for a while now. So the question where there will be in five years' time really almost entirely depends on us in terms of how hard we'll be implementing sanctions and export controls and companies withdrawing from Russia and whether, you know, sort of we will be engaging with the third countries in terms of sanctions with Russia. Because if the sanctions will end up being very porous, then, of course, Russia will be able to eventually find some alternative supplies. Of course, it's not going to be as advanced, you know, as, uh, as other countries uh, not under sanctions. But even if you already look at Russia now, it is not uh, a country like South Korea integrated into highly sophisticated global value chains, right? Some of the things that you, they will find more expensively and cheaper and more expensively and wor worse quality, but they will eventually find them. So if you look at the data for the last year on imports, imports contracted only 16%. Uh, exports of Chinese semiconductors, not, no, 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 I said it wrong, not Chinese, semiconductors from China and Hong Kong more than doubled to Russia. Overall, imports of uh, chips is um, more than 30% up last year for the year as a whole. Interesting and disturbing. <laughs> exactly. So if we, if we allow that to continue, yes, the technology will be worse. Yes, they will pay more for it. Yes, eventually their economy will be slowly deteriorating, but, you know, it will not collapse in five years even. Correct, and they'll have plenty of high-tech components for military uh, equipment. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Leonid, um, Putin made major miscalculations when he launched this big invasion in terms of Ukraine's ability to fight, Western support for Ukraine. In your judgment, does the Kremlin still entertain hopes for victory in Ukraine and the fracturing of Western support for Ukraine? And is Putin psychologically and politically able to reverse course in Ukraine and withdraw his troops at least to the February 23 lines? That's a big question. It's a big question. Well, first of all, define Kremlin. It's, the, it's clearly not united. So, as, as we discussed... A any insights uh, beyond we've Central spent... Central Bank and probably even the Prime Minister uh, were absolutely not aware about invasion right. to Ukraine, so no one was prepared. It was a decision that Putin made together with a very small group of um, allies, and this decision was not very much supported by many people around him. We know exactly about what their plan A was, like Kiev in three days or in ten days, and exactly, as you mentioned, he miscalculated, and it has shown that actually he doesn't have any plan B. And he's he yet to produce it. Uh, his uh, silence, very remarkable silence in the last six months when every uh, annual event has been uh, cancelled, like the annual press conference right. and the State of the Union speech and many other appearances that actually he had to make and talk about the plans. Uh, this all has shown that he actually does not have an answer, which is being asked by many members of his elite. Like, what's next? What our plan B? Where are we going to, like, retreat? Where, what do, where we want to compromise? How do we now see the possible positive outcome of the invasion? He doesn't have any answer for this, and this silence makes as, as louder, is getting louder and louder. And <clears throat> it doesn't uh, help Kremlin to have, like, a united, uh, solid uh, position on this, because, like, Putin doesn't give him orders. Does he still hope that the victory is possible? Possibly yes, probably yes, just because, well, uh, he is, as we know it, also very good, the victim of his own propaganda, with like FSB feeding him with the red folders of information uh, that are tailored in the way he likes to read, uh, receiving news that he enjoys, and his attempts to, you know, like, move uh, to, to rotate the generals clearly indicates that he, sti is that he still hopes that like some of the generals might uh, get, make him like victorious or at least like change uh, the course of the events uh, on, uh, on the front lines. Uh, it's, it's, it's apparently not realistic, mm, but he personally, psychologically and whatever, 
of course, is not able to retreat to the borders of February 23rd or to any uh, other borders. He created the situation where he actually doesn't have a way out, which is well, which is well, a good news, I believe, uh, because uh, it uh, closes any road to you know negotiations with Putin uh, to the worst possible outcome, which is like a frozen conflict for many generations, new green line on the map, which would become a political realities for years or for generations to come, and which would help him to prepare for like the third phase of the war for a revenge uh, and so on. Uh, rather, he is entitled like not to make any uh, agreement to, to, to continue fighting. And this will, of course, uh, contribute to like growing uh, conflicts between Putin and, and the rest of the Kremlin and the rest of his elite. Thank you. Lee, you want to jump in, but one minute. because we're, we're Yeah, no, I just questions. wanted actually to ask a question since I have this yeah. unique opportunity. What is your take on mobilization? And, uh, you know, Putin sort of did one, very damaging for his reputation. What do you think he can do next? Uh, so, uh, my take is that probably there will be no second wave of mobilization in terms of, like, Putin once again uh, in front of the camera announcing, like, a huge wave of mobilization because the first one was enormously damaging. It really... Uh, brought to tectonic changes in public opinion, in support for the war, in support for the invasion. This kind of like, the first wave of mobilization was unfortunately more of a shock to Russian society than the beginning of the invasion on February 24th. Because in February 24th, they still were able to sell to the majority of the society uh, the, uh, the usual paradigm. Specially trained people in a special military operation are performing their special tasks, and you don't have to care about this. Right. Like Putin takes care of everything, life continues as usual. So his social contract with the, this political sleeping majority wasn't broken on February 24th. Like you don't care about politics, and I ensure your life quality is decent. This contract was not broken. It was broken in September with the first of wave of mobilization, when uh, they came for their fathers, brothers, uh, husbands, uh, and sons, and suddenly people started to ask, uh, sorry, I mean, for seven months everything was, was, was going according to the plan. Why is it happening now? It was like a real shock, and Putin didn't like its consequences. And it was also was a logistical nightmare. nightmare. So they probably managed to draft like 300,000 over a million flat, over a million dodged, and maybe a few thousands, if not a few handfuls, actually volunteered uh, to draft like as, as, as volunteers, which clearly shows like where in the society like the, the balance uh, is with regard to like support, genuine support of this war. But this was this this was good news. Now bad news. He actually also don't need it. Mm -hmm. He won a lot of time with this trick mm. using the convicts. Uh, there were some of the uh, mobilized uh, people sent to the front lines. They notoriously like, died in this uh, Makiv Kashelin on 1st of January. Uh, some of them died in Svatova, in, in, in trenches. But these were more like mistakes, not, not the trend. The vast majority of them, of those 300,000 drafted in September, October, were not sent to the front lines. They were sent to training camps in Belarus, to training camps in, in Kursk, Belgorod. And he used these convicts, these uh, Wagnerites, to win time. So they, 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 they really used them as cannon fodder. They uh, wasted like, all of them like around Bakhmut and Solidar, but they won a lot of time to properly train uh, those people who were like drafted in September, October. So I believe that they will now be introduced to battlefields and uh, these resources are way from being exhausted. Now. Thank you. Really interesting, although not on sanctions. <laughs> Vlad, um, so we get to audience questions. Two minutes just to respond to anything that's been said. Well, I think it's important to understand that Putin is uh, trying to wage a war of attrition. Uh, he believes that the West will be exhausted pretty soon. Uh, that there will be bottom-up pressure from the societies on policymakers, uh, 
because of the high cost of energy crisis, because of inflation and different other impacts of sanctions. And generally, if, after all his experience, he believes in permanent generational changes of Western politicians. So he can talk with the next generation and try to make a, a settlement. He believes in his resource supremacy. So in these circumstances, the uh, right tactic will be to, to outlast and outweigh him. Uh, to win this war of attrition, which means, again, we're coming back to the idea of uh, strategic patience and on the impact of the Russian society. Of course, I agree with Elena that the economy will not collapse, but there will be such a significant downshifting that we haven't experienced for a long, long time. And let me remind you that two times in a row in the past 40 years, Russian system have changed because of the economic difficulties. First, at the uh, end of 1980s with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Another time de facto uh, with the support for a strong man after the difficulties of the 90s, there was another system change. And I would um, advise against comparing Russia to uh, cases like Iran or North Korea because these were not really developed uh, a very uh, brutal military regimes uh, oppressing people for a long time. By the way, we haven't seen uh, the end of Iranian story yet. The protests yeah. are escalating. I, s I would say that in the analysis of the impact of sanctions, we should more speak about uh, examples like apartheid era South Africa. Mm -hmm. Uh, where uh, and there's a lot of economic mm -hmm. studies on that, mm -hmm. where sanctions were not too strong economically, much weaker, but they had a profound impact on thinking of yeah. the people. They didn't want to be isolated from the rest of the world. So I think that's the most correct comparison, not Iran or North Korea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Andrew Manning on the impact of sanctions on the uh, agricultural sector in Russia. I, the reason I brought up mobilization, because mobilization had also massive impact, almost like sort of a self-inflicted wound and, and sanctions. Because if you look at the agricultural sector, first, we have a lot of combiners that are used. There's, these are John Deere combiners. You know, so a, a lot of equipment, also a lot of equipment in the processing of some of the agricultural sort of uh, goods um, comes from abroad. So already before mobilization, you saw late uh, sort of harvesting. And that, you know, means that the, the harvesting is, harvest is worse, right? So that is already having an impact. On top of that, you had mobilization. And in the villages, especially if we look for men and in certain professions, you already have a gap there for historical reasons for men of that age in, in, so in Soviet Union and post-Soviet Union space. But on top of that, you have normalization. And because they were originally very afraid of drawing from Moscow and St. Petersburg, they went for the regions. And you had the scenes where the grandmothers uh, had to use their non-savings uh, to buy in the fishermen's uh, shops everything to send their children, husbands, wife, you know, to the, to the war. So, but that also means you had no combiner drivers because they're like a sort of tank driver almost. So then that means again the you know, you could not do the harvest there. And finally, a lot of seeds in Russia imported. We forget about that, but a lot of them are, so last year many foreign companies said we're going to provide you with the seeds. It's not clear what's going to happen this year. Thank you. And I would, may I add to Please. this just a few points. Uh, agricultural sector is a very low margin uh, production. So that means a significant growth in expenses because of a lack of access to all this uh, Western uh, made or Western designed machinery, because of the change in logistics, uh, because of the sanctions against shippers, vessels, insurers. So th we saw that in grain. We had a record harvest, but no ability to export most of it because of the sanctions against the transportation uh, chain, right? So uh, sanctions kill the margins, already low margins in the agricultural sector. So we see many, except grain harvest, we don't see much of the bright lights in this regard. So it's impacted too. Thank you. Okay, we have a question here from retired ambassador, EU ambassador Paul Van Doren. It's for you, Vlad. He says, I fully agree that circumvention and invasion are the key problems to be resolved. What measures do you suggest to do this? First, I have to say that diplomatic work, and this is where probably the disagreement is, I think uh, diplomatic work has a lot of potential. And also, well, I believe that uh, the West has a lot of leverage on countries like Turkey, United Arab Emirates, uh, Israel, Serbia, which are currently providing a lot of Central Asian countries, which are currently providing a lot of room for evasion. That is, I agree that this should be divided into two parts. Some of the stuff that is illegal, so here we should press more about apply and applying secondary sanctions. Some stuff that is legal, which means that we need to expand the sanction space. And it's here, we probably disagree on that, but I truly believe that uh, change might come, political change might come in Turkey after June 2023 elections because 
the opposition Republican People's Party uh, is, is showing inclinations to join uh, the West on, on uh, certain measures and uh, probably joining the sanctions regime. So let's look into that. Uh, apart from the diplomatic pressure, I think what is important is to boost the sanctions compliance capacity, the administrative capacity. Because OFAC in the United States mm -hmm. is, I don't know how many, 250 employees mm -hmm. for all the sanctions in the world, Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, Russia, 250 people. European Union doesn't have a sanctions right. monitoring and implementation agency mm -hmm. at all. It's all done on the national level somehow. That's, that's not good. This is what we talked about that's with policymakers in Brussels. So the sanctions uh, compliance capacity should be boosted significantly. That's a very vital long-term task. Those are two very smart, down in the dirt mm -hmm. recommendations. Okay. A little round of applause Please. for some member states in the EU who have been quite good <laughs> at communicating on um, uh, their own enforcement of sanctions compliance. Uh, and I personally applaud uh, cases where you make sure all the TV cameras are there when you impound a particular ship or something. I think that actually works quite well. Uh, I'm talking about France, but uh, other countries should learn from that lesson. Um, and yes, I think it should be better coordinated at, um, in Brussels as well. Okay, we've got an interesting question from Tegan Kuandikov. I apologize if I mispronounced the last name. Export statistics in Central Asian countries clearly show signs of parallel imports of sanctioned goods, ranging from iPhones and cars to the import of Russian and Belarusian timber under the guise of Kyrgyz and Kazakh products using fake documentation. However, at the same time, these countries are trying to disassociate themselves from Russia internationally. What is this, dust in the eyes? When and how will the... A little bit snappy. When and how will the countries participating in the sanctions campaign take serious steps to ensure third party compliance? Anyone well, want to? Okay, maybe I'll please. comment on that, and I think that will help me to agree and disagree with both of you. <laughs> so, uh, and the way I'll do that is that it's very important to come to these countries not with a long shopping list. We want everything from you. No, we want these specific three items for the next year. And then we we'll talk again. So I think, you know, Turkey, of course, is not going to full-heartedly, full unless there is a change in the authorities, in the government, full-heartedly join in the sanctions coalition. Mm -hmm. But they might be more willing to engage if European Union will say, well, there you have access to our trade, you know, or international capital markets. You know, again, we have a lot of sort of financial flows with Turkey, and Turkey is still very macroeconomically vulnerable economy. So then we say that these are the top three priorities for us for this year. Let's talk. And the same thing happens with the Central Asian republics as well. Also, you know, we talked a little bit about the statistics here. It's extremely important we provide the statistics. The more Russia closes in its statistics, the more important there is a breakdown. The BIS publishes maybe some aggregated numbers on their licenses that they give, maybe not individual company, but more an aggregate. You know, maybe there is a better synchronization between the sanctioned, the export controlled goods versus the trade statistics. The same discussion on the, one well, we don't have time to touch on it, but on the export Export, on the export of Russian, the sort of the oil price cap. Again, where is the data from our side? And I think that is also very, very important. And we should press Turkey, we should press third party countries also to keep on providing that data. Okay, does anyone? I do mean to say that I'm, I also have some hope about a change in <laughs> Turkey. I don't think it's all um, uh, written in stone. Um, that being said, Turkey also is quite dependent on financial flows from Russia, mm -hmm. uh, which might explain um, why they're a bit more um, helpful than we'd like them to be. Thank you. Okay. All right. We have a question from Bill Courtney, Ambassador Bill Courtney, about the can central bank policy help mitigate the impact of sanctions in Russia? Absolutely, they have. I mean, I'm sorry, I've just so, so I've, I've written so much about it. No, but I think the whole sort of um, we should not. Uh, we should be realistic and should not be underestimating the other side. And I think that's what Vladimir and Charles and, and Leonid also said before, is that we shouldn't be fooled that, oh my goodness, they're all disappearing, they're all doing a bad job, you know. No, they, we have indicators that say that there are weaknesses somewhere, but the central bank, I think, was critical in terms of helping sort of prepare for the sanctions and also mitigate the impact. And I think that's why some of the very negative, I had very negative forecast of the sort of negative feedback loop between the financial sector and the real economy didn't happen. Because on one hand, it was a very skillful response. On the other hand, as I think Sergei Guriev said, it's much easier if you have special security forces and uh, then the bank runs are a little bit more complicated then. <laughs> May I add to this? Please, because please. Because I, I totally, I, I strongly disagree with this universal cheer <laughs> towards the central bank. <laughs> <laughs> because we need, to, we need to always consider at which cost it comes. Uh, 
So it more looks like a prodrazverstka, you know, the confiscation of grain from peasants that Bolsheviks introduced in 1918, you know, rather than uh, some, yes, they did mitigate some impact, mm -hmm. but at the cost of complete destruction of free convertibility mm -hmm. of the ruble yep, for the absolutely. first time in more than 30 years. I mean, people, investors absolutely. in the future, they will remember that more than they remember the 98 default. Mm -hmm. That will be a triggering event for assessing the uh, uh, currency risk associated with ruble. Oh, Russia did that before. They used to introduce draconian capital controls. They can do it again. The second thing, first thing they did after the beginning of the war, they concealed the statistics and, and uh, reporting from the banks. We don't know what happens on the balance sheets. And I, I'm, I totally disagree with optimistic assessments that, no, we uh, don't need this recapitalization. The damage is not too big. I heard this song before. I heard it after 2014, which ultimately resulted in collapse of Atkriti and major private banks three years down the road. All along, the Bewilderness has been saying, no, 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 there is no need for recapitalization. Things are fine. This, this is the same find that we hear all the time. So we can't, I mean, uh, central bank is really concealing uh, the, the vital problems on the balance sheets mm -hmm. of the Russian banks at the moment. Cannot be that the economic activity is contracting so much, but the banks are okay, just cannot be. I mean, so this is all this universal praise for the professionalism of the Russian Central Bank. Sorry, I don't share. I would compare this rather with what the Bolsheviks did during the Russian Civil War. Yeah. But, I mean, where we can all agree, so whether we praise them for their being like very professional and helping to mitigate risk, or for being very unprofessional, like in tactics of Bolsheviks, they all have to be targeted by personal sanctions. Absolutely. This is, <laughs> this is something that was <laughs> missing from today's discussions. Personal sanctions are important. John, if I may, just, John? just a few words. We, we really were focusing on the economy and social impacts of the sanctions. Right. But I think one thing which we really should mention is that uh, Navalny's Anti-Corruption Foundation list of 6,000, or is it, is it, oh, is it almost more? seven now. Almost 7,000 yeah, now. That is, even that is not enough to my personal opinion because I used to work for the government. I know a lot of these folks, and you know how they react to this. They say, oh, we will be fine. We personally will be okay, because sanctions are about this handful of folks at the top right. who are on the U.S. SDN list, and we, the mid-level officials, can continue the dirty work. So that needs to be significantly expanded. Yeah. Of, I know it's time and effort consuming, but it's worth it. Of those six or now almost 7,000 names, how many people have been sanctioned? 1,200. 1,200? Yes. So basically one-sixth or a little less. Okay, a little bit more. All right, we have one last question. Um, we have time for one last question from Ben Perkins. It's a little bit provocative, and it takes up some of the themes we've already discussed. He says, quote, the stated goals of the sanctions and export controls was to put pressure on influential Russians and degrade the Russian ability to rage war while minimize, minimizing harm to everyday Russians. The fact that you are now talking about alternative indicators like divorce rates, alcohol consumption, seems to indicate that individualized harm to Russian people is a key indicator of effectiveness in your view. Can you speak to this a bit? Yes, because it was Putin uh, who actually turned all this whatever happened in a total war, a total war between the free world and uh, his aggressive autocracy that is trying to redraw international rule-based order. Definitely, in a total war, there will be collateral damage. However, I mean, yes, uh, nobody wanted to do harm to ordinary Russian people, but it was Putin who converted this whole thing into a total war for the, for the global uh, order. So there will be collateral damage, and Russian people will have to understand that, and they are beginning to do so, as Leonid rightly put it. Anyone else want to I jump in on this? <laughs> okay. I think, sort of in addition to implementation, I will add better communication this year on sanctions because last year we have three pages on our report just taking quotes of what supposed objectives of sanctions were. So there was a very sort of quick response and I don't want to not praise the authorities. The authorities did a fantastic job. But I think this year we need to keep on explaining to Russian population that, it, you know, countries against the war are not against common Russians. You know, this is the objective is to, to stop right. the war. Right. Um, I think that's absolutely right. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for a great discussion. I, I can congratulate Vlad on this wonderful report. So and we'll be doing more work on sanctions in connection with the Geo Economic Center and Charles and Josh. And thank you all for tuning in, and we'll be doing more. Thank you all.